Good morning, everyone. Glad to be with you this Lord's Day morning, filling in for Jesse Flowers. The Flowers family is away in Florida this week, and we pray for their safe return tomorrow. I want to welcome everybody who's with us. Glad to see some visitors here and want you to know that you're our welcome guests and invite you back every opportunity that you may have. I want to talk today about uh, our thoughts. There's a verse uh, that I think about a lot in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. It says, we're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Every thought captive. What a challenge. I want to talk about our thoughts today. Let me put up a few thoughts that maybe you've had. I wonder if he thinks I'm pretty. I'm worried that about my perception at work. I don't feel valued. How about, don't they know today is my birthday? That's okay. Some of these are funny. I wish my dad was proud of me. That's kind of kind of deep. Nobody said anything about my effort today. And you can fill in the blank. You know, I worked hard on this. Nobody said a thing. How about, my kids didn't even call me on Mother's Day. Shame, shame, kids. But mothers, have you ever had that thought? How about, if I mess up, they'll laugh at me. Or how about, I only got three likes. Maybe you're starting to see some things that are in common. How about, I'm nothing without her. All these different thoughts, you'll notice they're not specific to any age group. You might find yourself thinking some of these thoughts and not others, or maybe at a time past in your life you had those types of thoughts running through your mind at times. But in each case, some similarities you see throughout there kind of reflect maybe some low self-esteem. I want to talk about a concept today called seeking affirmation. We are seeking sometimes affirmation from others to feel good about ourselves. You know, this isn't a new idea. Uh, in fact, if you're old enough, I'll date myself a little bit to remember this Saturday Night Live skit, Daily Affirmations with Stuart Smalley. You know, this, th uh, I, I remembered the skit, but I didn't remember it was called Daily Affirmations until I was putting together this lesson. You've got this guy, and as the, as the intro screen is coming up, this is a comedy sketch, of course, but as the intro screen is coming up, he's saying these things to himself, giving himself some, some daily affirmations. He's saying, I deserve good things. I'm entitled to my share of happiness. I refuse to beat myself up. I am an attractive person. I am fun to be with. You know, he's saying these things, just trying to drill it into his mind and gain some confidence. You have this guy, it's Al Franken, not, not any kind of a guy that I, I like. He became Senator Franken out of Minnesota. But he's, he's looking in the mirror, talking to himself, building, him, building his confidence, right? And he, his catchphrase was, I'm good enough, and I'm smart enough. And people like me, right? And it's like if he just says that enough times to himself, he'll start to believe it, right? He's, per, he's trying to get these affirmations to build himself up, right? It, the, the gag is, uh, well, he's only like a, one tiny mistake from falling off the wagon and going back to, I'm terrible. You know, this whole, this whole show is terrible. Nobody's going to like it. You know, I'm a failure. I'm an idiot, right? All the thoughts that are right on the edge of his mind right, that he really believes, these, these negative thoughts. So he's trying to put in some positive thoughts to counteract that. It's the idea of, of affirmations. I ran across a song, and I don't usually listen to lyrics very well. I, I may like a song and then find out, oh, that's a terrible song, right, when you finally listen to the lyrics. But one, one that I recently heard on the radio uh, was this song called You Say by Lauren Daigle. And when I first heard this song, uh, I thought it was by Adele, which I know some people are probably laughing at me for that. Some were like, who's Adele? 
right? That puts me in the middle, right? <laughs> middle age. Uh, so, but it's it's a fantastic song. Sounds great. It's on the radio. Um, and so I started listening to the words. She starts uh, by saying, I keep fighting voices in my mind that say, I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. And in the chorus, she says, you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. And you say I am held when I'm falling short. And when I don't belong, oh, you say I am yours. And I believe, I believe what you say of me. I believe. It's a, it's a, it's a neat song, but, you know, that, that first verse, she's, she's, notice what she's saying. She's got this inner dialogue of I'm not good enough, right? I, I will never measure up. I'm just the sum of my good days and my bad days. And so I got to have more good days than bad days or people are going to think I'm a loser, right? She doesn't even know who she is. But then she starts talking about this person who uh, can help her change her mind. These affirmations, right? That she is more than that, right? That she's loved, that she is strong, that she's held, that somebody cares about her, that somebody, somebody considers them hers. Those are some amazing encouragements, right? You know, as I was listening to this kind of for the first time, listening to the words, I started thinking about some of my relationships and how I've, I've felt this way in the past, right? Uh, it made me think of times when I was craving affirmation, uh, and to be honest, there's times where, uh, you know, if there's just that one person in your life who thinks of you as a good person, a strong person, uh, that's all you need, right? Everyone else may be critical, you know, for me, right? My wife, Bonnie, if, if, if she thinks that I'm good, if I'm worthwhile, there's been times where it's like I just crave a little bit of affirmation from her, and it's like that's all I need. You know, maybe it's your parents, or maybe it's a grandparent or a friend. That one person, they're your rock. They, they know who you are. They care about you, right? It's so sweet. But, you know, on the other hand, it also sounds a little needy, right? That you need, need your, that maybe I need my wife to say something positive to help me get through the day. And if she doesn't, what happens? How do I feel? It gets kind of, it gets a little worse in verse 2. The only thing that matters now is everything that you think of me. In you, I find my worth. In you, I find my identity. Uh, you get start getting a little concerned at this point, right? That's, those aren't really healthy thoughts. This verse started me thinking about a few of the broken relationships I know about, right? Where maybe a person went through a divorce or maybe it's just a breakup, right, of, of uh, boyfriend and girlfriend. I uh, think of those who end up going on to committing suicide because, boy, I, I thought that I was valued by you, but then you just kicked me to the curb. Now I don't know who I am, right? And so she continues with the same, same chorus. These are not healthy thoughts, and they're especially not healthy thoughts for Christians to have uh, about themselves. We want to talk today about this idea of Christians seeking affirmation. We're Christians. This shouldn't be a, a a problem for us, and I want to show you three quick things from the scriptures that we need to understand uh, about seeking affirmation, what God says about this. We haven't defined the term yet. Let me give you a few definitions. Defining affirmation, one, one definition is that it's an assertion that something is true, emotional support or encouragement. In law, it's a judgment by a higher court that the judgment of a lower court is correct or should stand. So think of it this way. You know, it's something that you think is true about yourself. You hope it's true, but you're waiting to hear someone else say it so that you can believe that that thing is true. And I think it's interesting about the law that it's a higher court, right? Yes, it's an affirmation. This court made a judgment. Now a higher court is going to say, yes, that's the right judgment, so now it stands. But we're doing that with other people, right? You're higher than me. Uh, I don't believe it about myself, but if you, t if you say it, then it stands, then it's true. 
So you're placing other people up above yourself so that you can gain some confidence. And you need to hear that from somebody else. It also says in, on this website, mindtools.com, affirmations are positive statements that can help you to challenge and overcome self-sabotaging and negative thoughts. Well, if, if we can avoid some of these self-sabotaging and negative thoughts, then maybe we don't need these positive statements. It comes from a, a, a better, a more healthy self-image. Another way that this type of behavior is described as an approval-seeking person. It's concerned with how they are perceived by others and look for validation outside of themselves. Are these descriptions of a good, healthy Christian? They seem to describe a person who has that low self-esteem, right? A, maybe an emotionally needy person. Now, we all have emotions. We all have highs and lows. But is this the description of a Christian? Is this what God wants for each of us? Let's look at the scriptures. First of all, three quick points this morning. We need to be careful not to seek after the approval of others. Doesn't the Bible teach that? It says over in John 12, it says, Nevertheless, even many of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue for... They loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. You've got to ask yourself, is that you? Is the approval of men what really matters to you? That's dangerous. It's dangerous because we don't know what kinds of things men will approve. They're not very wise sometimes in the things that they approve. Notice Romans 1.32. Although they knew the ordinance of God that those who practice such things, he's just listed off a bunch of sins, are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So looking for the approval of men, you may find it even while you're doing something that God would certainly not approve. Notice Paul's attitude. He says, for am I now seeking the, save, the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. As a bond servant of Christ, we're looking for Christ's approval, like we'll talk about here in just a moment. It's a danger. It's a danger to be going after the, the approval of men or seeking to please men. I just want this person to say something nice about me. I'll do anything, right? That's a dangerous path to go down. Notice some of these affirmations that you might find. This is just a few that I grabbed off the Internet. All my dreams are destined to come true. Is that a true statement? All my dreams are destined to come true? I don't know if, if that's a good affirmation to be giving somebody. Don't worry, your dreams will come true. We don't know the future. Your dreams may be misaligned to what God wants. We don't know his will for us in our lives. You are worthy of love. This is a common affirmation. But if a person's telling themselves that they're worthy of love uh, when... They're trying to decide, should I leave this guy who doesn't seem to love me anymore? And there's this other guy who seems to, to care about me more. I'm worthy of love, so I'll divorce my husband, run out on my family, and go be with somebody else. That's dangerous, right? These are man's affirmations. I am letting go of all that no longer serves me, right? That's a dangerous one. That's a very uh, anti-biblical thought, right, that... If it doesn't serve me, I'm not even going to care about it. It's very selfish. You even find some affirmation groups like this one, the LGBTQ Mormons family and friends. So if you are an LGBTQ Mormon, you can join this group and get your daily affirmations that you're an okay person. Because, by the way, the Mormon church doesn't stand for these, those LGBTQ behaviors. And so you can imagine the guilt that a person might feel if they're uh, lesbian or gay, they're engaging in those activities, and they're Mormon. So it, you can find a group that will affirm whatever behavior it is that you want. There's a, uh, I know there's a group for those who have been withdrawn from by churches of Christ. Because I'm sure that's a traumatic experience, and you may want a support group to help you feel better about yourself, rather than receive the, the, the shame 
that should cause you to want to change and come back to the Lord. Romans 14, 12 says, Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. That means you can condemn yourself in what you approve. You've got to be careful not to do it. Certain things should not be approved of, right? And so if we're seeking affirmation, we may find someone who approves behavior that is not godly. But notice what else, what else we find uh, in seeking the approval of others. Uh, in this instance, you have Jesus in a time of need, a time of great need, right? He's going to his father the night before he will be put to death. And he says to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into, into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. If we need others to, to be there for us constantly to affirm who we are and what we do, we may find that they're not there for us when, when we need them, right? Because even if they're willing, it says the flesh is weak. They fell asleep. They couldn't even watch for one hour with Jesus. Are they going to be there for you when you need them? It's kind of an unreliable source. Notice this, similar in Proverbs 19. It says, many will seek the favor of a generous man, and every man is a friend to him who gives gifts. But, there's an implied but there, all the brothers of a poor man hate him. How much more do friends abandon him? He pursues them with words, but they're gone. So, yeah, if you've got money, your friends will stick around. They'll probably be there for you. Really, they're there for themselves. But you may not be that type of a person, and guess what? When your friends, when you really need a friend, they could be gone, unavailable when you really need them. It says in Psalm 41, verse 9, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Psalm 38, My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague and my kinsmen stand afar off. That Psalm 38 context is that he's, he's got sin in his life and all of the pain and suffering that go, comes along with it and there's just no one there to help him out. See, looking to others to constantly build ourselves up, it's a failed proposition because people are unreliable. Just to sum up, men will approve evil things. They may be willing, but men are weak. Men are unreliable. Men are selfish. They may not know that they need to be there for you when you need it. Ask yourself, what happens when you don't find it? What are you going to do on that day when you really just need that affirmation from somebody else and you can't find it? Are you going to sulk? Are you going to just be depressed that day until you get that shot in the arm? Are you going to quit? You know, if you don't get the attaboy from your boss that you kind of crave, you're just going to quit working hard? Are you going to get angry or give up? Give up on everything? Ask yourself why you need it. You know, when we uh, constantly need the praise of others in order to go on, you open yourself up to the manipulation of others. They can see that you need that and, you know, basically treat you how... They want to treat you, put you in the mood they want you in for that day. You're, you're dependent on someone else to feel good. Opens you up to a lot of emotional abuse. Makes you a very dependent, fragile person. You know, uh, we've talked, a few people in, in lessons have talked about that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Uh, and it was pointed out that, that that's a lie, right? Can words hurt? Yes, they certainly can. But I thought about why we learned that, that saying. We learned that saying as a defense mechanism, right? Because there's a bully out there who's calling you an idiot, who's using those negative uh, terms that can get in our minds and we can get really down on ourselves. So when someone called us names, we would chant that back in their face, sticks and stones can break my bones, words can never hurt me. Doesn't bother me. It helps you to let that criticism roll right off your back. If someone calls me stupid, does that make me stupid? No. If someone calls me worthless, does that make me worthless? Nope. Sticks and stones. You don't have to be that fragile. If someone criticizes your work, does that make your work a waste of time? Should you just give up? No. No, they're just words. 
with that kind of a mindset, we can be strong. We don't have to be so ready to just give it all up, right? So weak that we need the praise in order to continue our work. <clears throat> it could be that you need this affirmation because you know there's a problem, that you know there's something that you should be doing that you're not. And you've got to examine yourself along that line as well. <clears throat> but secondly, and I think the obvious parallel to this, uh, is that we have to live with confidence in the approval of God. I'm sure you knew I was going here. Who should we be seeking affirmation from but God? Men will let you down, but God will not. He has not. He has already done everything he could do for you. And because of that, you should be a strong, confident person. Look at a few verses. There are so many, but I had to pick just a few. The first one I thought of was Ephesians. <clears throat> because the book of Ephesians is about the church and explaining who the church is. <clears throat> Here it says, God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Chapter 1 had talked about him raising Jesus and seating him in the heavenly places, and now where are we? Seated with him in the heavenly places with Christ. We've been promoted to that position. What a marvelous place that we find ourselves and a few verses later, he gives us a purpose. Here's who we are. You don't have to wonder who you are and what your purpose is. It says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. We don't need someone else to tell us who we are. We know who we are. We are Christians, and we have work to do given to us by God. The latter part of Ephesians 2, he says, you're no longer strangers. And aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. God is our family. We are one of His children, and that should give us great confidence. Someone can tease you and run you down about who your family is, or if you grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, or you're from the wrong county, or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. I'm not really that. I'm this. I am a part of God's household. As Jude read in our scripture reading over in First Peter, you are a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. He wanted to possess you <clears throat> so that you can proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. There's a purpose. Now that you are God's own possession, that's what you need to be doing. I love the, the, the verse that follows that Jude also read because Peter is quoting from Hosea. And if you remember our minor prophet study in the book of Hosea, he takes a wife of harlotry and he has children. And God gives him the names of those children. And those names are symbolic. And the second child he's told to name Lo-Ami. You were once, you, you were not a people. He wants them to know through these symbolic names that the people of God are rejected. You, you, were, you were not a people. And then later he has another son and names him Lo Ruhama, which is receive mercy. You had not received mercy. Lo Ruhama means not receive mercy. But later he changes those two names, giving them that glimmer of hope. And Peter is now explaining that that time has come. You were the Lo Ami people, not a people. But now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. With that view of ourselves, the people of God, that should elevate us. We are the people of God. But then that next one humbles us back to where we need to be, the one who has received mercy, right? It's a wonderful thing to be in God's family, but it's also a humbling thing. It puts us in the proper place, not so low that we're depressed and ready to commit suicide, but properly humbled to know that we've received mercy and now have a purpose as a child of God. You know, the third verse of that song, I know some of you know I was going here, there's a little bit of a twist. That You Say song by Lauren Daigle, she then goes on in the third verse saying, taking all I have 
and now I'm laying it at your feet. You have every failure, God. You have every victory. I didn't know she was singing about God all this time. It's, it's uh, now suddenly I have to go back into those other verses and rethink some of what she's saying. Pretty cleverly crafted song, right? And so when you go back through this, this chorus, you say I'm loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I'm strong when I think I'm weak. You, think, you say I'm held when I'm falling short. When I don't belong, you say I'm yours. I believe what you say of me. I believe that, right? That's a good Christian attitude. It doesn't matter what I think of myself. What does God say about me? I'm approved by God. That's all that matters. When you have that mindset, it doesn't matter what anyone else says about us. And I think that's a really good message from that song, that we know that what God thinks of us, what you say of me, is what I believe, if we are, in fact, walking in the light. It says over in 1 John 4 and verse 4, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You've got God on your side. Isn't that what it says in Romans 8? If God is for us, who is against us? Why are we afraid of anything? Why aren't we walking around with bold confidence into every room and every situation, knowing that God's going to give us success and that we don't have to worry about what other people think about us, right? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a chart? Sorry, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Doesn't that sound like sticks and stones? Words will never hurt me. Who could bring a charge against God's elect? Right? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. We have these things. We have God and Christ on our side. In Revelation 12, <coughs> it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of our Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. It's talking about Satan. Satan had been cast out. The one who will accuse us is gone. It reminds me of the story of the woman caught in adultery, right? After Jesus said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, where did her accusers go? They all walked away. They'd been cast out by their own shame, their own guilt. And then he said, where are your accusers? Where are those who would condemn you? There was no one. And he forgives her sin. Where are our accusers? They've been cast out. God has conquered the devil. This beautiful picture in Revelation 14, this is describing us. Then I looked. And behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These, are, these have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. It's a figurative number. The Jehovah's Witnesses try to cap it at 144,000 and say there's not going to be any more. No, it's figurative of that perfect huge assembly of those who do this. Follow the Lamb wherever He goes. That's us. We've been purchased, and so we should be the ones standing atop the mountain, confident that we are with Christ, that He's with us, that we're going to be victorious. We shouldn't be seeking the approval, approval of others because we have the approval of God. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a third point that is from Scripture that would be easy to overlook in a lesson like this. If, if we focus so much on the one who is downtrodden and needs to pick himself up, we might forget the simple fact that the Bible teaches us not to withhold encouragement from others. Just because you don't need to seek the approval of others, just because you should be strong, in knowing that the Lord is on your side, that doesn't give me the right to withhold encouragement from you. Doesn't the scriptures, don't the scriptures teach us to encourage one another? 
Isaiah 35, verses 3 and 4, it says, Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, Take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Notice that the encouragement is actually kind of what we're doing today. It's a reminder that God is going to save you. So while we're encouraging one another, it's not just, you know, I think you're a good guy. That's only going to go so far. <clears throat> it might it, a, a more powerful encouragement is the Lord is on your side because that's something eternal, something truly strong. First Thessalonians 5, we probably know a lot better. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. Notice who it is that he first starts with that needs encouragement. Appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. You ever think that the eldership needs a little bit of encouragement? They do. It's not just the one who's new in Christ or the one who's young, maybe struggling with sin. It's the one who's working hard. Need, they need encouragement as well. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. And then, yes, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. We need to be encouraging others. We don't need to withhold that just because they shouldn't need it, right? We should do it because we love them. Notice these commands. Sometimes we study the home, right? And it says each individual among you is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. In the context of this lesson, aren't these commands to be showing encouragement to our spouse? that that wife needs to know that she's loved, that that husband needs to know that he's respected? What about children? Honor your father and mother. That phrase, honor, that, that word just means you need to show them honor. It's not that one day I may give you a, a card that says, oh yeah, by the way, I, I honor you, or I, I love you, or respect you. They need to see it. They need to see that you're showing them honor. And in, in the other way around, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Do we need to be encouraging our children with a positive word from time to time? Absolutely. It can't constantly be negativity over and over. Romans 12, verse 10, it says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Jesus said, you know, over in, uh, ah, I forgot to write it down, over in the book of John, that a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, so you should also love one another. That's the, that, that's a pretty tough, pretty tall order, is it not? When it says you're supposed to owe love to one another, we don't owe anybody anything else except for love, or we shouldn't. Uh, and when we love one another, we fulfill the law. If we're withholding encouragement from others, then we're not fulfilling the law. We're not showing love. So just three things we need to remember. Be careful not to seek the approval of others. Live with confidence in the approval of God, but don't withhold encouragement from one another. I cringe when I see Christians seeking affirmation, kind of fishing for compliments, unsure of themselves until somebody says they've done a good job, right? And the reason I cringe is because Christians shouldn't be that way. Christ was not that way. It's not Christ-like. Paul was Christ-like. And two quick examples before we close from Paul's life. You know, when he was facing criticism, didn't bother him. And we, when he was receiving some approval from others, didn't really phase him in a good way either because he knew who he was. Over in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, he said, it's a, it, to me, it's a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court, in fact. I do not even examine myself, for I'm conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. He knew that God's estimation of him was all that mattered. And so when he was facing the criticism of the Corinthians, who were saying, I'm of Paul, no, I'm of Cephas, no, I'm of Paulus, they were caught up in pride and who the greatest teacher was, so they were criticizing him. No, it didn't bother him. 
because it's a very small thing for him that he's examined by you. That's not how I get my sense of self-worth on what you think of me. Notice the opposite situation over in the book of Galatians 2. It says, but from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. He's explaining that they were working together in the gospel. Uh, there was no disagreement between them as they went on to preach to the Jews and to the Gentiles. But when pillars, <clears throat> you know, it's just like, you know, I got a letter from the president saying that I'm a good guy, you know. Did that matter to Paul? Was that what made him, that helped him get out of bed in the morning? No. He says, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. That's the kind of bulletproof character that we can have in Christ. Because the one who I'm, the, the one, the approval that I'm seeking is the Lord's. It doesn't matter if you say something good about me or bad about me. I want to know what does God say about me. That's the lesson for today. We've got to be careful not to let this creep into our thoughts. We've got to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We don't need to look in the mirror, mirror and tell ourselves how great we are to help remove our self-doubt. We need to humbly submit to God and receive the adoption of sons that he offers. If we're not in Christ, though, these things do not apply. As you examine yourself and, and find that you may be outside the body of Christ, yeah, you may find that you've got some depression. And those depression issues are a lot more difficult to deal with because sin causes depression. You need to turn your life over to Christ. Similar to the way that lady's song said, you know, I'm going to lay all these things at your feet, at the feet of Christ. Continuing in sin causes depression, and we need to turn away from that. You know, I think about the story of Cain, right? When Cain uh, offered an insufficient sacrifice to God, he got down about it because God didn't like his sacrifice. And God told him, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? We need to remember that. We have the option to please God, to serve him every day. And that's going to be what lifts us up, knowing that I have God's approval. If you're outside the body of Christ, you have an opportunity to become a Christian right now. The scriptures teach us once we've heard the message, the gospel message, and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you can repent of your sins, turn away from them. You can confess openly before men that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then you can be buried in water to have your sins washed away to become a Christian. You rise from the water as a Christian, as a new man, having put on Christ and then you live a life serving him, knowing that you have his approval. It's an amazing confidence booster, and it's also an eternity secure, knowing that you have a place with him in heaven. If you're in Christ, and you've recognized you've let some of these thoughts creep in, you can put that aside. Put on uh, the thoughts that God wants you to have each day, and begin that today. We can help you. Whatever you need is, we invite you to come while we stand to sing our invitation.